we can start slowly. We have explained that uh, the peculiarity of this text is uh, the uh, syncretic attitude to uh, all the uh, principal Buddhist traditions that existed or started to crystallize to exist in the time of Kumarajiva. Hmm? So uh, we see we have a lot of different concepts, some taken from the Mahavibhasa Shastra, some taken from the uh, uh, Nagarjuna's Madhyamika or Arya Deva, some taken from even from the Vigyanavada. He must have been because the Kashmiri tradition was closely linked to your This chapter. meeting is being recorded. Okay. So now finally we are recording. We are approaching the official beginning. So uh, the uh, Kumarajiva is trying kind of to syncretize different traditions. This also has influenced, as I have pointed out, practically all schools of Chinese Buddhism. Most important schools of Chinese Buddhism are indeed syncretic. And uh, we will see this uh, syncretic tendency actually from the beginning of the text to the end. Even though the uh, Shravaka approach is the base, and the Shravaka approach is based on basically on uh, the uh, Sarvastivada, but we see already in this text a very, very clear inclination, like in Vasubandhu to uh, share the Sautrantika view. Hmm? We will be more aware of it also. And uh, so let us start now. The time has come. So the text says, furthermore, there are three categories of dharmas, namely body, mind, and mental factors. So this indeed is a Sautrantika view. We all know that for the uh, Mahavibhasa, for the uh, Sarvastivada tradition, uh, we have also uh, the category of Chitta Samprayukta. Hmm? So uh, the uh, Kumarajiva, like Vasubandhu, inclines to the Sautrantika view. The body is a leader in the realm of desire and the realm of subtle forms because there the mind follows the corporeality. In the previous paragraph we have seen that in the Kama Dhatu, in the sphere in which we are, where our perception is dominated by the five pancha guna, five objects of the five senses. This is what we mostly think about, what we eat, what we drink, what we touch, what we see, what we hear, what we smell. Hmm? So uh, our mind is, so to say, by nature distracted. For beings like us in the Kama Dhatu sphere, it is much more difficult to learn uh, deep concentration, which is a natural state for the Brahmas, for the gods. 
uh, in the sphere as we have seen in the previous paragraph in the sphere of uh, subtle forms in Rupa Dhatu the sensation becomes predominant because uh, the objects of the senses are not clear but the sensation the mind becoming more pure the sensation become more and more outspoken so the joy is uh, becomes very powerful the happiness becomes very powerful the detachment become very powerful hmm? then uh, it says in the sphere of infinite space and infinite consciousness uh, it is the consciousness which becomes uh, predominant because uh, one in order to enter these spheres first one has to detach and become disillusioned with rupa and then in order to enter the sphere of infinite consciousness one has to be disillusioned with the object which is uh, the objects means the objects of the mind then what remains is only the mind and because the mind is taking infinite object so the mind becomes also infinite so we have explained this is very important for vipassana also to see clearly how the mind reacts in accordance with the object uh, we make in mind by our manasika by our attention then uh, in uh, the uh, sphere of nothingness in which we will discuss today in the sphere of nothingness the perception becomes predominant in the three lower rupas as explained in uh, Mahavibhasa uh, the uh, infinite space infinite consciousness and nothingness is based on preliminary exercises on the prayoga and they are named after this prayoga uh, but in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception it is actually uh, the uh, uh, mind formations themselves which become the predominant factor why because uh, the perception and the sensation is not clear anymore so uh, when uh, there is no corporeality anymore then only the power of mind functions now very important passage mind has two aspects one takes in space as object that is the uh, mind in the sense of alam banam chintati iti chitam the mind is defined as that which uh, thinks about the object the other takes itself as object so uh, here we are uh, uh, kumarajiva is so to say coming to the vigyanavada point according to vigyanavada uh, the uh, mind is has three aspects the uh, lakshana aspect the aspect of taking the characters of the object the darshana aspect darshana bhaga the aspect of seeing and finally the self-witnessing aspect 
the Svasamviti. This is a peculiarity of the so-called uh, Chitamatrata or Vigyanavada school. According to other schools of Buddhism, uh, the mind, just like knife, does not cut itself, finger cannot point itself, the mind does not see itself. What it sees actually as the self is the past mind. And this is actually experience everybody can make in the state of jhana, when in the mind the meditator sees the mental image he takes for the object of jhana, then he will also see the mind which goes into that mental image which has been fixed in the mind. That's why one can enter the jhana. So uh, that means uh, this uh, mind has two aspects. One takes space as an object. It is the aspect of seeing and the aspect of what is seen. And uh, other takes itself as object is the aspect of the self-witnessing mind. Self-witnessing mind is the peculiarity of the Yogacara school. The other schools usually do not speak in terms of mind taking itself as an object now. Of course, it take, can take itself as an object, but as a past object only. For this reason, there are two spheres, the sphere of space and the sphere of consciousness. In the first sphere, one abolishes forms, so it receives designation, the sphere of space. So, in order to, according to uh, the Pragya Paramita Sutras, uh, the whole, in order to, same idea you will find put in a different way, even in Visuddhimagga, to understand the whole, you have to break the whole. When the whole is broken, says Pragya Paramita Sutra, the whole is seen. And the whole means uh, the subject and the object. This is a whole. This is all we experience. The Nama and Rupa. So, uh, when the uh, Rupa is not born, the name is also not born. The mind and mental factors are also not born. When the form arises, the mind with mental factors also arises. This is a mystery of the mind. The whole, uh, actually, uh, Yogacara tradition is investigating this mystery of the mind. What is there when the mind does not fix itself on a, any object in particular. This is very important meditation on, uh, in the Buddhist tradition on the mind being like the space. Mind is of course not the space because the space is not alive but mind is very much alive. But it is like the space or like the mirror in its quality of reflecting the image without distorting. So uh, this quality is, is linked to what the Yogacara calls the self-witnessing aspect. The self-witnessing aspect is, so to say, before the mind divides into subject and object. From the self-witnessing aspect, we have the seeing aspect. From the seeing aspect, we have the lakshana aspect, the characteristics of the object. And from that, we have all the differentiations that form our uh, way we perceive 
ourselves and the world. So uh, when you break the idea of object, as we have seen, in, uh, by investigating uh, the nature of the object, nature of the form, then uh, you break the uh, mind because, as the text explains, the uh, mind is also uh, created. It is not uncreated. So it says, because consciousness perceiving space becomes the object, thus even so the other aggregates exist in the sphere of consciousness. Nevertheless, it is named after consciousness exclusively. So the mental factors work in consciousness and we can actually... Uh, observe them and analyze them in Vipassana, but they work uh, clearly only under the uh, uh, circumstances that we pay attention to an uh, object in particular. In all Buddhist traditions, actually, the, the, uh, the cognition process starts with attention. When we pay attention to an object, which is called manasikara, making, literally making object in the mind, the mind, uh, as we know it, with an object and with an subject, appears. So, when there is neither subject nor object uh, clearly to be defined, so what remains? remains a nothingness. But this nothingness is also not real. How we get into the sphere of nothingness? I think I have explained. By investigating in the infinite consciousness, the object which is infinite space. It does not exist there. And the mind becomes so subtle that it takes this non-existence of infinite space and infinite consciousness as an object. So that object is also, of course, created. It is created by the circumstances. So uh, it is a sphere of nothingness, which means akin chana. But in Buddhism, very important to know, the uh, kimchana, the kimchit, is the synonym of raga. You will find in Majjhima Nikaya, explained also. And uh, when there is uh, raga, the Anguttara Nikaya says, raga upajitoa pugalan kimchati. It is when the raga arises, when attachment arises, then there is a, something like a pugala, like a person appearing as a real, as a real something. If there is no raga, if there is no attachment, then there will not appear a person as something real. So, According to this principle in Buddhism, that what makes the person appearance of a person real, as something separate from the whole, is actually the kinchana uh, function of raga. Raga, the attachment makes kinchana. The attachment makes something. And something here means something existing. Something existing as separate from the whole. 
So this is very important to understand. So with this understanding, we can go to the analysis of the third arupa, which is uh, the sphere of nothingness, akinchana. So uh, paradoxically, it would be uh, uh, like nirvana, the sphere free of raga. But of course it is not free of raga because it is created. Created by what? Created by perception. That's why perception is dominant in this sphere. Strictly speaking, what perception? The perception of the non-existence of space, infinite space, in the infinite mind. This non-existence, such a subtle concept, becomes an object. But it is only a concept. How can such a concept be considered real? But yet, this concept is very helpful for the Vipassana, uh, breaking the uh, idea of real existence, of, uh, of real object and real subject. Because a real object is based on the real subject, and a real subject is based on the real object. The two must come together. Then we get the idea of something real. So uh, the Pragya Paramita Sutra says because the Pragya Paramita transcendental wisdom is uh, does not arise. Therefore, uh, the uh, all dharmas are called the great Pragya Paramita. Because the Pragya Paramita, like Nirvana, does not arise. If the Pragya Paramita or if uh, Nirvana were something which arises, then it would be, of course, created. And that which is created cannot be the highest reality. So, uh, what is here progress in a, in a more subtle perception? The progress is that uh, the uh, object is nothingness and the nothingness cannot have any uh, concrete characteristic whatsoever. If, when the mind moves, it moves because it gets hold of the concrete characteristics. But here, in nothingness, there are no concrete characteristics to be held. So, with no concrete characteristics to be held, then what remains is this akinchana, the sphere of nothingness. But this sphere of nothingness <laughs> only as a concept. And why? The text explains. So, how does one get into the sphere of uh, nothingness? The same process by getting the... We have explained in Buddhism, we have the Laukika Bhavana and we have the uh, Lokutara Bhavana. Lokika Bhavana, Lokutara Bhavana. Lokika Bhavana is Shamata. And uh, Shamata in, uh, at least in uh, the 
perception of the disciples is the uh, uh, getting disillusioned by gross object connected to gross sensation and gross mind and thereby attaining a more subtle object which is connected with more subtle sensation and more subtle mind. So uh, this is precisely what is to be done if one wants to enter the higher arupa. One has to get dissolution from the lower arupa by contemplating the impermanent nature of this infinite mind. Even so, it is infinite mind because it has infinite object. It also appears and dis disappears by causes and conditions. Now, in our text, as uh, precisely as in Abhidharma Kosha, this is also uh, more approaching the Sautrantika view. It appears in dependence on causes and conditions without freedom. We have explained why without freedom. Because in order that it appears, there has to be an object. The nothingness is also an object. There has to be attention to that object. And there has to be will to stay with that object. Otherwise, we will not get there. So, it is, of course, created. So, it cannot be the object of liberation. According to commentaries, the Buddha, under his uh, uh, first teachers, also studied these arupas, akinchana and naeva sanya, na, 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 na asanya. But he, as opposed to his teachers, he did not see it with his uh, clear intelligence as the object of liberation. That's why he decided to practice being non-satisfied after having mastered all the dhyanas so that they requested, the teachers requested him to teach them to others as objects of liberation. But he saw very clearly these cannot be objects of liberation because the objects of liberation stays. It cannot go away. And these objects, they come and go. So how can they be objects of liberation? Having seen, penetrated this fact very clearly, contemplated over it, he left his teachers and practiced six years long ascetic practices, dutangas. Then, uh, being dissatisfied with these uh, dutangas also, then he discovered the middle way, which is studying vipassana in shamatha, studying vipassana in the dhyanas. However, it is explained in different way in different traditions. The idea is the same. This idea is same in all Buddhist traditions, all genuine Buddhist traditions. So, uh, because Consciousness is something created. Consciousness does not abide in sensations, nor in the objects of sensations, nor does it abide between them. It neither has an abode, nor is without abode. You cannot say that the consciousness is without abode because it is there, but you also cannot say that it has an abode because it's always changing. We have explained uh, last uh, week that 
despite the fact as uh, the uh, Sutta Vasutta teaches the uh, Putujana they cannot see the non-self nature of consciousness but they can agree on the non-self nature of the Rupa and from here from Rupa they can agree on non-personal nature of uh, sensations because sensations are bound on Rupa then from impermanent nature of sensation they can accept the impermanent nation notion of perceptions because the perceptions are inseparable from sensations from the impermanent non-self nature impermanent nature of sensation they can accept the impermanent nature of will formations and here we are we come to the middle of the impermanence which is the mind itself like middle of the wheel even so it moves fastest we don't actually see the middle of the wheel axis of the wheel moving we see the wheels moving we don't see the middle of the wheels moving so now the mind becomes very subtle so it can see very clearly the uh, non-self nature of the consciousness so it is understood what buddha teaches that consciousness is like a maya like an illusion so the text says space being elusive and decept deceptive illusionary rather and deceptive so are the characteristics of consciousness all these objects are just illusion and deception and thus all real dharmas are but uh, vexations may be better uh, troubles here hmm? upanaha of sentient beings emptiness nothingness is peaceful and stable because it is a more subtle object therefore it is more peaceful more stable always a more subtle object is more peaceful more stable so we come to the question what is the difference between the sphere of space and the sphere of nothingness this is very important in order to understand this question we have to know a little bit chinese it does not make much sense in uh, in sanskrit or in pali because space is akasa and uh, nothingness is shunyata hmm? but in chinese it makes a perfect sense because the space is called shi kung and the nothingness is called kung actually nothingness shunya means literally zero in the uh, indian languages shunya even today shunya means zero like when you telephone you say shunya shunya zero zero five five and so on so uh, the uh, space has the quality of nothing that can be held and uh, nothingness also has a quality of something which cannot be held you cannot uh, the zero is there but you cannot really hold it and the answer is very clear uh, in the first mind perceived space as an object now in this sphere 
the mind perceives nothingness as an object. Nothingness here means akimchana. Akimchana means here not in the sense of there is no raga. The real akimchana is the nirvana. And this fear can be mistaken and was mistaken for nirvana. Because nirvana, like zero, it cannot be grasped. You have to add or subtract something, then you can grasp. Similarly, uh, to understand uh, uh, nirvana, you have to add or subtract something from it. You have to add it as existing or you have to subtract something as non-existing. Then you can hold it. This is a difference between them. When the practitioner has entered the sphere of nothingness, if his faculty is sharp, he will be aware that there are still sensations, perceptions, formations and consciousness in it. Because it was created. It was created by paying attention to an object, by being uh, disillusioned with another object. Hmm? And uh, so uh, it is uh, Samskrita, not a Samskrita. So if the meditator has a sharp faculty, then he is, of course, aware that this sphere of Akinchana cannot be the Paramartha, cannot be the highest reality. Because uh, there must be still sensations, perceptions, formation and consciousness related with it. Otherwise, it would not arise and it would not cease. So, he becomes disenchanted, nibida, nirveda, so he can go higher. The same principle in shamatha, same principle in vipassana. First, we have to be disillusioned to go higher. If we not disillusion, we will not go higher. No matter how we explain Buddhist meditation, this principle is exactly the same in all traditions. Without Nibeda, without Nibida, there is uh, cannot be uh, liberation. Impossible. So now comes interesting passage and furthermore there are three views guiding the meditator to leave the sphere of nothingness. The sphere of nothingness is not meant to be an object of liberation. It is meant, it is meant to be an object of disillusionment. And it is by disillusionment that one goes higher and higher. So, uh, there are three views guiding the meditator to leave the sphere of nothingness. The view of real existence, the view of non-existence, and the view of neither existence nor non-existence. Hmm? The view of existence is prevalent in the realm of desire up to the realm of limitless consciousness, which the meditator wants to leave. The view of non-existence is the sphere of nothingness. Because there is no clear subject, no clear object, so uh, it is the sphere of non-existence. The view of neither existent nor non-existent is in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. Now, in order to 
witness the highest, one has to abandon all views. This is same in all Buddhist tradition. It does not mean uh, abandon all views as uh, something which stays in uh, the uh, practice, but all views uh, of something existing by itself. Existence of something by itself is the uh, base for idea of non-existence and also of the view for idea of neither existence nor non-existence. So the understanding of the object of liberation is connected with understanding of the ultimate view. The understanding of the ultimate view is abandoning all views. Because the holding the view is also prapancha, is also based on expansion of perception due to raga, due to tanha. And the nirvana is always nishprapancha. It is nirvana because it's not based on prapancha, not based on shilun, not based on expansion of perception due to raga. It cannot be there. So uh, it means uh, the meditator experiencing the sphere of Akinchana has a tendency to the view of non-existence. Based on denial of the existence of object, infinite space, and subject, infinite mind. So this is how one, according to this model we have seen, model of Laukika Bhavana, of worldly meditation, one abandons the more gross by getting disillusioned with more gross and uh, seeking for more subtle. Then, more subtle as far as uh, perception is concerned, is only neither perception nor non-perception. Where the perception is, as we will see, not real perception. Not real perception in the sense that it can be used for vipassana, for uh, seeing by dividing. But then you have the subtlest of the subtle, that is the object of liberation, which you cannot, no way to grasp whatsoever. According to the commentaries, neither Shariputra nor Maudgaliana nor anyone can analyze the five aggregates in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. Only the uh, Samyak Sambuddha himself, while his mind is so subtle due to the accomplishment of all the paramis, he, even in the highest sphere, in the Bhava Agra, on the, in the top of existence, he can still differentiate the five aggregates of existence. That means he can practice vipassana. He can see their anatta nature. They are not having any freedom 
anatta means not having any freedom not having any freedom because one is determined by object by attention and by all the other mental factors which form the mind so uh, in other words, in order to dwell in Nirvana, all views, this is same in all Buddhist traditions, all views have to be abundant. This is the ultimate view. We will see this very clearly when we analyze the four noble truths after the Arupas. Now we have the second question. In the Buddhist teachings, we also have emptiness as nothingness. We have explained this uh, Chinese hmm, put them together. In this way, this is real. Hmm? So the uh, in Buddhism, shunyata. Even so, shunyata, emptiness cannot be grasped. It is real. It is real in the sense that by penetrating shunyata, one can realize the liberated mind. So in this sense, according to this uh, student, it must be real. So why do you refer to it as being wrong view that ought to be abandoned. Again, the confusion between Akinchana and Shunyata, between the sphere of nothingness, which is fabricated by the mind, and the sphere of emptiness, which cannot be fabricated. Emptiness is emptiness because it cannot be fabricated. If it is fabricated, it will not be the liberating emptiness. Answer. In Buddhism, this view is based in order to break attachment and therefore it is said that this should not be considered real. Hmm? Uh, this is very important to understand and this is a base for understanding the Nagarjuna's philosophy. Hmm? Emptiness, Nagarjuna says, emptiness is uh, like uh, the uh, elixir which can uh, remove all views but it can only remove all views, especially wrong views, if you hold it, if you grasp it, if you understand it in the correct way. And he compares it to the snake. If you, want, if you catch the snake by the tail, it will bite you. And you will experience a lot of pain. But if you catch the snake behind its head, then you will be able to use his poison as a medicine and help others and help yourself. So uh, Nagarjuna compares Shunyata to a ghee. According to Ayurveda, when you mix a ghee with any medicinal decoction or herbal preparation, its efficiency will be doubled. Similarly, if you add Shunyata 
to any view, any correct view, its efficiency will be doubled. So this is very important. So uh, anything, if it is considered to be real, real meaning self-existent, having a lasting Svabhava, own nature, this view necessarily leads to Manyana, leads to the false idea of an existing self. You cannot avoid the idea of an existing self as long as you adopt the view of something really existing. In Buddhism, really existing means self-existing. This is very often misunderstood but it is the essence of understanding the Buddhist philosophy, the Buddhist practice, and it is the base for all Buddhist practices, no matter whether it is the practices of the disciples, practices of the Pratyeka Buddhas, practices of the Bodhisattvas, all are based on this principle. If you hold to something as self-existing, you are bound to create the idea of a real self. This cannot be avoided. There will always be Atma Graha as soon as the idea of self-existing object crops up in the mind inner object, outer object, say. So, uh, so, uh, the uh, sphere of nothingness cannot be the paramartha, cannot be the highest reality, because, of course, the beings born in there, they uh, are born on the base of the resultant karma, however long their life may be, they are still subjected to impermanence. And uh, when uh, their resultant karma is exhausted as if their wisdom, if they have no perception of the direct perception of the real object of liberation, which cannot be grasped, then they are again subjected to the samsaric existence as usual. So, uh, the real emptiness, that means the uh, liberating emptiness, has actually nothing to do with the sphere of nothingness which is uh, created. The two are very different indeed. So, we come to the end of the worldly existence, the end of the worldly existence, this whole Buddhist cosmology is based on that, is called Bhava Agra, the top of existence, because beyond that is nothing that can be grasped. And that nothing that can be grasped is precisely the emptiness. This is the difference between Akimchana and the emptiness as means of liberation.
So there is no bhava, no samsaric existence, no beyond the bhavagra, beyond the uh, uh, top of existence. And how do you get to the top of existence? Of course, you have to di be disillusioned from Akinchana sphere, from the sphere of nothingness. And when you disillusion from the sphere of nothingness, then you turn again the same process as with going from the sphere of infinite space to the sphere of infinite consciousness. You turn the mind which has been fixed on the concept of emptiness on itself. So the mind becomes the object, not the emptiness which you have understood as being inferior, being a gross, because it is still subjected to the uh, samsaric existence. Now, uh, this uh, sphere of neither perception nor non-perception is the uh, highest object the mind can take in samsara. Beyond that object is the non-graspable object. And that object is the most subtle because you cannot say it is not object of clear perception, but you also cannot say that it is not an object of non-perception. Neither perception nor non-perception. So how you get to it? Of course, again, by uh, contemplating that all mind bases connected with perceptions. I have explained that all the lower arupas are based on the prayoga stage. They are named after the prayoga stage, after the stage of uh, effort to get there. But in this stage, you already have not, uh, in the stage of uh, nothingness, you have nothing really to rely on except the perception of the nothingness. Then when you get disillusioned from this perception of the nothingness, then you can go higher. And you can go higher, of course, because the will formations, will formation to do so becomes predominant. So uh, the perception there, because it is gross, it is ill. You meditate on it as being anything, uh, as as being as bad as a cancer, as a disease, as anything that you find disgusting and having contemplated in this way you turn the mind on itself and because you have been disillusioned by this lowers you can go to the higher and that higher is the perception is the mind contemplating the uh, non-existence. This mind is has neither perception nor non-perception. Uh, it is explained. The first question: If there is perception. Uh, does perception exist in the sphere of uh, in this sphere or not is a question of the meditator 
of course, the answer, there is perception in it. If there was no perception in it, then it would be, uh, uh, would be uh, the Niroda Samapati. Only in the Niroda Samapati there is no perception anymore. So the object and the subject is Nirvana. But here the object is not Nirvana, the subject is also not Nirvana. So it must be subjected to the samsaric existence. If there is perception, why are only the lower seven stages of concentration called with perception? So this is very important. We will answer that and stop here for today. And next week we will finish the uh, uh, Arupas and go to the discussion on the Four Noble Truths. It says just same explanation as you get in Visuddhimagga. In this mind the base perception becomes extremely subtle and not sharp. It cannot be called perception because it cannot be used for perception. Visuddhi Magga gives a very interesting stories to illustrate this. Like uh, Acharya with his Shishya, the, with his disciple, teacher with his disciple. The teacher is uh, very thirsty in a uh, Indian hot summer. So he sends his disciple to search for water. Then his disciple brings a bowl of water and uh, uh, he, uh, the, uh, the teacher tells him that uh, now let's take our uh, bathing rope and we can go to bathe. And he says, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is no water there. How? How there is no water? Uh, there is no water enough to bathe. But there is water, but not enough to bathe. So similarly, there is perception in this sphere, but not enough to take it as a, uh, as a perception as such. So how to call it? Neither perception nor non-perception. It is perception because it is still subjected to the uh, impermanent nature which is uh, for a developed mind unsatisfactory by nature, dukkha and selfless. But it cannot be grasped as perception as such. It is too subtle already to be understood as perception. And without perception, without clear perception, we cannot analyze. Because it is perception which is based for consciousness. And the consciousness is the base for wisdom. First there has to be perception, then there has to be consciousness, differentiation. First there has to be differentiation, then there has then the wisdom can come. So uh, there is perception, but this perception does not give rise to a clear differentiation. And without the clear differentiation, you cannot use the vipassana. You cannot use the wisdom of penetrating the law of anatta. So that much for today.
uh, we will finish the Arupas next week and start with the Four Noble Truths, which is one of the most important topics of Buddhism in general. And the Four Noble Truths, as the text is teaching, due to this experience of uh, neither perception nor non-perception, can uh, become, uh, if the meditator has wisdom, can become a very challenging uh, because one is at the very top of samsaric existence. So as the text is explaining, there the obstacles to vipassana, if one tries, will become very, very outspoken. Because you are at the top of existence and beyond the top there is nothing to grasp. So the Mara, as the text says, if the meditator is intelligent, the Mara becomes alarmed. And when the Mara is alarmed, all the obstacles can come in with great intensity. Okay, so uh, that much for today. So let us see if there are any questions. If there are no questions, we can do the Punya Parinama and finish here for today. Hmm? Okay. Are there any questions? Can I ask one, Kanti? Okay, Supriya is coming. Small one. Yes, I managed. My Wi-Fi was restored, so I managed to join. I missed most of the lecture, but I will listen to the recording. So, um, it's just a very broad question, Kanti, not specific to this, but this entire process is really about completely dismantling the world as we understand it in our ordinary life, right? Yes, and in that process, when somebody is meditating, what is it? I mean, is there, does, wouldn't there be fear? Wouldn't there be uh, distress? What are the factors which keep the meditator going on forward? Of is course, there no pulling, I mean, cause of wisdom. just listening to it without having attained it, I'm asking the question. So you bear with me for that, yeah, I'm sorry. This is, uh, these are the states of deep concentration. In deep concentration, there are no clashes. In deep concentration, there are no clashes. The clashes, they don't belong to samadhi. This yes. is a state of uh, samadhi. So in the state of samadhi, there are no kleshas. When one goes out of samadhi, then the kleshas come. And because samadhi makes the mind very sensitive, so these yes. uh, kleshas will be much more troublesome than for someone who has no samadhi. Because someone who has no samadhi has no understanding of the beauty and uh, uh, peace of uh, uh, pure mind. Right. We have fear because we have very deep impurities yeah. of mind. Uh, because uh, of our personal stories. Everybody has his personal story. Everybody has his personal frustration. Uh, yeah. This is uh, natural. But in Samadhi, you do not see this. You have to go out of Samadhi to see this. But as long as the Samadhi has an object you can grasp, it uh, will not lead to uh, the direct realization. Only when object you cannot grasp appears in mind, then 
the we will learn discussing the four noble truths then the middle path will occur in the mind the middle path cannot according to buddhism cannot occur in the mind as long as there is an object which can be grasped this is very important to understand and many people don't understand it even they study buddhism for a very long time uh, the middle path can only appear when there is no object to grasp then the mind uh, can uproot the defilement otherwise it can weaken the defilements but not uproot and uh, you cannot have uh, the uh, uprooting of defilements if you not in samadhi it is not possible that's why the last uh, of the uh, ashtangika marga is the samadhi but mm -hmm. here it is a lokutara samadhi not lokika samadhi a lokutara samadhi has what object sunyata animita hmm? apanihita nothing to grasp in sunyata nothing to grasp in uh, animita no sign of object nothing to grasp in apanihita no desire nothing to grasp so the all the uh, sila siksha samadhi siksha and uh, panya shiksha can appear together otherwise they will not appear together impossible only when the object is the one you cannot grasp they can appear together hmm? so buddhism is very very deep but uh, uh, it's not easy to understand if uh, one could explain nirvana then everybody would try for nirvana but because it cannot yeah. be explained we are trying for everything except in our modern world mm -hmm. we're trying for everything except nirvana because it cannot be explained so people don't believe in it okay there, yes, was, sir, there was one question i have seen but i did not pay attention to it because i was talking i think uh, yes uh doris Bo is asking how is the how does bodhicitta relate to emptiness well uh, bodhicitta is based on understanding of emptiness if one has understanding of emptiness one can give rise to bodhicitta because the bodhicitta is based on wisdom and compassion the wisdom is understanding of emptiness of impossibility of self-existing nature anywhere and uh, on compassion because we deluded beings we do not see it so you get bodhicitta the enlightened mind and even so you have you are not enlightened you have enlightened mind so as shanti deva describes you have something you so wonderful you even don't know how you came to it but it is indescribable it is just beauty by itself so uh, this is bodhicitta okay this one more question bande osman is asking does nothing to grasp relate to non dualism not necessarily because uh, nirvana is also a shunyata in a way it is also 
uh, zero. It cannot be grasped. But it is still opposite to nir to uh, samsara. But the sunyata in the Pragya Paramita literature is uh, not opposed to anything. So uh, the relative is also shunya and the highest is also shunya. There is nothing except the shunyata. So Arya Deva says uh, that uh, uh, when you understand the shunyata, you cannot see any object whatsoever. If you understand one object, then you will believe in existence of all objects. <laughs> if you don't see any object, you, you cannot uh, see existence of any object. But if you see one single object, hmm, you will see existence of all objects. So in the Zen tradition, when you get training, they will tell you that uh, the, if you see as much as a wing of a mosquito, you go to hell like uh, uh, you go straight to hell. So if you see as much as a wing of a mosquito, you go straight to hell. This is the Zen saying. This is Pragya Paramita. This is Bodhicitta. Okay, so uh, shall we do the Punya Parinama? Yes, please. Thank you, Bhante. Eta vata chamehi sambhatam punya sampadam sabbe deva anumodantu sabha sampati sidia Eta vata chamehi sambhatam punya sampadam sabbe bhuta anumodantu sabha sampati sidia Eta vata chamehi sambhatam punya sampadam sabbe satta anumodantu sabha sampati sidia Aka Satta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanumoditwa Chiramrakantu Loka Sasana Aka Satta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanumoditwa Chiramrakantu Desana Aka Satta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanumoditwa Chiramrakantu Tumantara Devo Vasatukalen Sasa Sampati Hotucha, Pito Bhavatu Lokocha, Raja Bhavatu Dhammiko, Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. So see you next week.